On this week's episode, the Peacock struts its feathers, major changes to Gamescom and Comic-Con, and are we ready for some Justice League Dark? All this and more as we once again delve into the pop culture cosmos. Welcome to the pop culture cosmos. And we're back with another episode of the Pop Culture Cosmos. This is Gerald Glassford from Pop Culture Cosmos, Game Source, the Lakers Fast Break, and Inside Sports Fantasy Football. We truly appreciate everyone out there listening to all of our great shows. But it wouldn't be a Pop Culture Cosmos without my good friend. He's our own Artemis Fowl of Pop Culture Cosmos. You got to check out what he's doing today at popculturecosmos.com. Also, his great show, Topic Ocalypse, and of course, his awesome book, which you can get today on Amazon or Barnes & Noble. Congratulations, you suck. It is my good friend. It is Josh Peterson. What's up, man? What's up? What's up? I'm uh, I'm just chilling, man. Chilling. Doing a little, uh, little podcasting. I have been reading about Artemis Fowl. And uh, I mean, I didn't read the books, but I have been reading about his journey to Disney Plus. And I am uh, curious to see how that does. As am I, my friend. It is going straight to digital now. It is bypassing the theaters, similar to what we're seeing with Trolls World Tour, My Spy, and a couple others. Disney has decided in one of its many reshuffling number of movies, what's coming out, when is it coming out, they've decided to go ahead and forego the theaters for Artemis Fowl. I think they should do the same for New Mutants, but they are going to go ahead and put Artemis Fowl straight to Disney Plus in the middle of June. So looking forward to that and seeing how that will run, seeing how that will play out. But I wanted to ask you, as we're starting to see a little bit more movies being just, you know, just biting the bullet and sacrificing the dollars at the box office. And this is something you and I have talked about in recent episodes, and we're going to be talking about it again. I don't think it's always the right move. Trolls World Tour, it won't ever make up the entirety of what it would have made at the box office and then going to digital. But it's still, with its record numbers, still doing fairly well, and it's going to recoup some of those losses. Do you see the move as a good one for Disney when it comes to Artemis Fowl? Uh, I mean, I don't know if I'd say it's a good move. I know Artemis Fowl is based on a really popular series of novels that a lot of kids are familiar with. I see it more as a necessity than anything else. Like, it's one of those films that has been, you know, they've talked about it for a long time. There is, you know, an, an audible hype over this film, and I just, I don't know if holding off on it and waiting to release it because they're going to have a bunch of big films hitting theaters as soon as theaters reopen and i don't know if putting artemis fowl in the midst of that is a great idea so it looks like artemis fowl is going to disney plus bypassing the theaters i'd like to see and as we mentioned this before if you want to go ahead and check back with one of our previous episodes a couple weeks ago on the reshuffling of the decks of many of these disney films don't even have a release date anymore that had one that got taken right off the board by Disney. And one of those movies is New Mutants. And New Mutants, I think, should go ahead and follow suit because that's been something that's been delayed and delayed and delayed. And any fan interest in the property has probably just come and went. So I think they should go ahead and put that straight to Disney+. Plus. Maybe it would find some new life there. I think in the right cases, as we've seen, like with Trolls World Tour, and also, like I mentioned before, with Netflix, with the Cloverfield Paradox, bypassing the theaters and going straight to digital, in some cases, I think, is a smart move and would be, I think, following suit for the New Mutants. Yeah, I'm confused why they don't just put it out on Disney+, Plus or even on on FX, because it is something that Disney sounds... it makes me wonder if they have special plans for this movie because it's one of those things that just has been, you know, it's been kicked to the curb so many times and there's so many things that have prevented this from coming out. And it feels like it would just be something that would be great to put out on Disney Plus as opposed to putting it into theaters because it doesn't really sound like Disney has a lot of faith in it anyway. So why not just put it out there? I agree with you. It's just something just 
put it out there at this point. I think there's a, it's a lost cause. We saw with Dark Phoenix what happens when you are stubborn enough to try and continually think that you can put this movie out and people will actually watch it. I mean, some of the Fox properties that they have or that they were given in this Fox Disney merger have just truly been lackluster at the box office. And I think it was probably in their best interest to go ahead and send it straight to Disney Plus so it feels more special. So it probably would have garnered more interest. But unfortunately, that's not the case. But we'll see what happens when Artemis Fowl comes to Disney Plus in the middle of June, in fact, June 12th to be exact. So we'll, we'll gauge and see exactly what the kind of reception that it gets when it comes out in mid-June. But we are going to have a great episode. We've got a lot of things to talk about today. We're going to be talking about Gamescom, Comic-Con, Justice League Dark, the Peacock Network. We're going to be talking about all that stuff. Plus, we also got two great guests coming up in Noah Ian Fine talking a little bit more retro gaming. And also as well, in the second part of her April TV update, it's Jessica Box from the TV Ratings Guide.com. So she's going to be by talking about the TV scene going on right now with all the ratings and everybody staying home and whatnot. So glad to hear her once again on the show. But my friend, I wanted to ask you this. 51 years, my friend, of Comic-Con comes to a screeching halt. It gets canceled. I think that's probably one of the biggest news items of the week. Comic-Con, a something that you and I look forward to, to seeing all the events, seeing all the different halls, to see the different presentations, all the shows, all the movies, all the hope that these fans have, and all these these productions have when they go ahead and talk about their great projects, unfortunately is gone by the wayside because Comic-Con is canceled for this year. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't surprise me. It is something that needed to happen, obviously, but at the same time, like I'm curious, is it, did they say it was going to go digital or are there, you know, are the people who are going to attend, are they going to do some kind of digital presentation or is it just gone completely? At this point, there's been no indication of any type of digital event. They could change their minds. They could make something special out of it. We'll have to wait and see. But at this point, it's been just wiped off the board completely until next year. I hope that they're going to follow the lead of Gamescom. Gamescom is also, as far as a live venue, is canceled. But they are having a digital event over the course of a few days later this year. So I'm looking forward to that because there's still going to be a lot of great presentations there. And I think a lot of game announcements will still be taking place and we'll still be able to see a lot of good trailers and all that, especially the European markets, which have really embraced the Gamescom atmosphere. They're still going to go ahead and be a part of this great digital event for Gamescom, even though the live event, which approaches 200,000 individuals on a normal any given year, unfortunately, is going to not take place this year. But with Comic-Con, I've not heard anything yet as far as digital-wise. So I'm hoping that there will still be, because just imagine if they were still even to host a digital event, all the trailers and all the type of things they could do within that environment still and create a nice and actually truly cool video event. Well, I mean, that's what Comic-Con is known for. It's known for all the trailers and all the star, the Marvel stars coming together, Supernatural, Warner Brothers, whatever it might be. All these people coming together, the exciting new announcements, the new shows from Net- Netflix. Like, There's all these, these things that happen. And this is probably a really bad time for comic book retailers, too, because they're the ones that kind of make a lot of money at these trade shows, especially Comic-Con, because it's so huge. And this is a... You know, with the news that Diamond Publishing is no longer putting things out, Dark Horse is not going to be doing things till they're able to print th- print and distribute again. Marvel has been canceling so much. It's making, it's not just a bad time for the film industry, but this is also a bad, you know, announcement for the comic book industry in itself. But I will say this, my friend, you didn't hear as far as the latest updates from these distributors. DC is going to find its own distributors and might start sending out comic books back to comic book vendors as early as late April. And with Diamond, Diamond hearing that and hearing that news stated, you know what, we're going to go ahead and reevaluate things and start sending out things possibly as early as mid-May. So by mid-May, we could have things as far as from a comic book standpoint and a distribution standpoint, somewhat more realized. I'm not going to say back to normal because nothing's going to be back to normal for quite some time. With a comic book distribution, looks like some distribution type battles are going to be set up between DC and Diamond. And that could mean that new issues and new episodes 
could be on their way soon to, to comic vendors worldwide, which would be great, which again, like you said, would be something that would be helpful if promoted properly on a Comic-Con video type format. Well, it's funny. This thing with Diamond is really a, an issue they created for themselves. You know, I don't know how, you know, I get it. You know, the COVID thing is serious. I don't want their employees getting sick or whatever it is, but they're really, they're working in their, their warehouse. You know, they're, they're pretty isolated. All they're doing is shipping comics out. So, I mean, I'm, I'm curious how much thought went into the decision not to distribute. Now they've created a, a, a trade war with one of their biggest clients. So it feels very weird to me. And I'm curious how much thought went into that whole, you know, that whole process. But it's just kind of ironic now that they are now in a, in a bidding war, I guess, with because of something they did. It is interesting to watch as a whole, as far as the comic book industry. And I think the very livelihood of the comic book industry lies in the balance on what these distributors and what these manufacturers, a- aka DC, Marvel, Dark Horse, and whatnot, decide to do going forward. So it's going to be interesting to see how this all plays out. But as a entity, Gamescom is going to become digital for this year, and Comic Con, as of now, which I'm hoping will be changed, will go to a digital event. And if it does change to that, we'll update you as soon as we can right here at the Pop Culture Cosmos. What are your thoughts out there on Gamescom, Comic-Con, and everything we've talked about so far? Give us a heads up, popculturecosmos at yahoo.com. You're listening to the Pop Culture Cosmos. You've heard others, but nothing could prepare you for the shameful stupidity that is the Jock and Nerd Podcast. Hear Imran. So if you offend everyone at once, it all it's a wash. I've covered everybody. Anthony. Sorry, I was texting. Say that again. And Rug Boy. Yeah, whenever there's a snowstorm, my slack hole tightens up. As they talk over one another. Just exactly uh, the same Connor as, Jay, as Tim. Terminator. We're talking over each other. It's fine. Sorry. Swear and ask you for money. Just give us the money. Witness the hubris as they claim to be the world's authority on comic book movies. Who said that? Never said that. You've never said that. Who cares? A jock said that. Comic book, TV, movie reviews, news, and whatever they choose. Available on Apple Podcasts. Spotify, and wherever you find your favorite podcasts. The Jock and Nerd Podcast. It can't be silly, goofy fun. Seriously, people really listen to this. Uh. Jock and Nerd! Well, my friend, I wanted to ask you real quickly about Peacock. It's kind of up. It's kind of like in a beta stage right now. There are certain users allowed for, to go ahead and, and already see and use the service right now. All the stuff they're talking about as far as a pay service, and then they've got a free option. Those I don't think are up quite yet, but they already started debuting teasers and trailers for some of their shows. And let me give you a listing of some of their new shows that they're talking about. Revised Saved by the Bell, Punky Brewster, Psych 2 movie coming out, AP Bio is coming out for another season, Angeline, which is going to be a, a limited series, Brave New World, which Alden Ehrenreich from Solo, A Star Wars Story, he is going to be a part of it. It's not a overwhelmingly impressive lineup. It's not an overwhelmingly interesting lineup. I think basically Peacock is going to try and whatever they have in the queue, whatever they have in the library as far as NBC and Universal stuff already that they can feed off of is what they're going to rely upon. So I want to ask you, like Peacock is out pretty much in the same month as Queeby, and both these startups are coming out at a time where there's a lot more eyes on it. But the problem is once everything gets back to kind of a normalized state or whatever the new normalized state is going to be, are the eyes going to be on Quibi and even more so Peacock, especially with HBO Max coming out? So I've actually read a lot of interesting reviews about Quibi. And from what I'm gathering, a lot of people don't like it. They like it kind of contradicts the whole binge culture. Like you can't, sit there and watch an entire show and really feel like you got anywhere with it. So that's like the, as far as the reviews I'm reading from IG and Polygon goes, as for Peacock, I think they're relying heavily on their catalog of past shows, right? Because sign that, you know, a show as big as Seinfeld, right. Is something that they are kind of banking on. I'm sure they have, you know, they have the Seinfeld writers lined up for something. They're probably trying to get another season of Seinfeld put on. 
And they're really, I think right now, as far as new content goes, they're kind of really banking on nostalgia. And that's something that we've talked about a lot. Is nostalgia enough to put the wind into the sails of a new streaming company? I guess that's the biggest question here. And then you also got to talk about whatever they have in their library, the Fast and Furious movies that they've actually shown as part of their, their trailer, trying to hype it up. I think they have The Office back, if I'm not mistaken, from Netflix. I think if that's where it goes, I think that's one of their big foundational pieces because The Office proved to be such a huge foundational piece for Netflix. So that's something that they want to go ahead and entice people to come in. But their new stuff, their new movies, their new shows, I know some of them have been delayed because of what's going on with coronavirus. And same thing for HBO Max. HBO Max, when it comes out and when it debuts later this year in a not-too-distant future, that also will have shows that they were planning on going ahead and being at launch that are not going to be at launch because of COVID-19 and all that. But I'm just not impressed what I see, so I'm not sure I want to go ahead and put any or invest any money into it. I'm curious, though. One of the things that they are doing that is smart is they're offering a free portion to give you a taste of it before you decide to go ahead and, you know what, I want to go ahead all in on everything that they've got at Peacock. So I asked my friend, offering a free service along with a premium service, is that a good idea for Peacock? I think it's a good idea outside of a just a normal 14 to 30 day trial. Something I wouldn't mind trying out. It, it, I'm intrigued enough by it. And if they're putting new content on there by writers from shows that have been successful, it's something I would definitely be interested in checking out. But you know, at the same time, like, what is it that's going to pull me in and lock me into Peacock as opposed to me just jumping services when I want to watch something? I think that's the big question that a lot of these streaming services need to ask. And with Peacock, they, they really are banking on people wanting to watch continuations of old shows. And are they going to have the whole back catalog of Saved by the Bell on there? What is What does this all look like? You know, it, it's what is it that's going to keep me enticed with peacock like once my 30-day trial is over what's going is there enough content to make me even want to pay for a month of it well it's not even going to have a, a i don't think well may i'm sure it will the premium will have some type of trial but you got to remember this uh, peacock said it's going to advertise tiers and one of the tiers is a free tier so there will be content always available on this free tier that you can access at any time for free but they will also have of course a lot more to offer with a premium tier which i think like you said, we'll have some type of free offer, but uh, they're promoting that you can go ahead and just stay on Peacock, whether you don't want to pay for it, period, or you want to go ahead and invest into it as a service. Oh, well, I mean, that, that's that's pretty nice. I know Funimation's app kind of does that same thing, too. Like, you can watch a certain amount of things for free, but it has ads on, and if you want to pay for the premium, then they'll remove the ads and you get access to the entire library. So I kind of, I do like that system. I do think that that's a great idea. But again, it's also, you know, what is going to make me want to pay for the premium? That's, you know, I'd love to see like a list of everything coming out on the Peacock so that I can kind of see, hey, is, is this something I want to continue paying for? Is it something I just want to sit around and enjoy the, the the free trailers? Or is it something, are they going to release something that's premium only and that's going to make me want to pay for the premium after my 30-day trial is over? See, that's something that HBO it does very well. You know, after your 30 day trial is over, you can't, unless you're logging in with a different email address or different account, you can't have a free 30 days over and over again. They know like where the IP address is and what email addresses are being used. So when there's something like a season two of Westworld or season three, you have to pay for that month. So I think that's kind of a clever ish idea. Hmm. How would you know about this, sir? Hmm. Been trying the system per se. Yeah, a few times, man. Uh, Game of Thrones, Westworld, and His Dark Materials, all these shows I want to watch. Well, fair enough. That's the options that are out there for you for people who are interested in looking more into Peacock. Like I said, it's, I think, in a beta stage. Some users are actually going ahead and getting a chance to check it out right now. I'm sure that's going to be rolling out a lot more in the coming days, but technically it is kind of out right now, so it is Peacock. And again, if you want to check out some of the new shows that they have, the trailers that we've shown on our Pop Culture Cosmos social media on Facebook, you can go ahead and check out there. 
again, if you're interested in Saved by the Bell and Punky Brewster sequels, the revising of these shows, Brave New World, that movie coming out, the Site 2 movie, AP Bio, Angeline, it's not an overwhelmingly impressive lineup that's now available launch. But then again, if it's something that you're interested in, they do have Universal behind it. So you're going to be seeing a lot more Universal projects coming to it. And, you know, if you're interested in the Jurassic Parks, the the Fast and Furious, I know they're going to be pushing those down the line. So as you see more and more properties from NBC Universal come to the Peacock Network, it's going to be interesting to see how that plays out and how that shapes up. In comparison to the success already, 50 million plus viewers for Disney Plus, you've got Hulu out there, you've got Quibi, who is also a new entity trying to struggle to get into this marketplace, and of course the big boy Netflix out there. So it's going to be interesting to see how this relates to what's going on within the realm of the streaming marketplace. And of course, with HBO Max on the way, that in this environment, which at a higher price point, is going to be a tough sell right now for a lot of people who don't have the means to go ahead and afford it. That's going to be something that down the line we're going to see if people are willing to go ahead and invest in that or just stick with what they have when it comes to the streaming marketplace. What are your thoughts out there on Peacock and NBC Universal's streaming offering that's coming out there? It's actually out kind of right now, but I know it's going to be advertising more in the near future, so you're going to be hearing a lot more about it coming up here in the coming months. What are your thoughts on Peacock? Share us your thoughts, popculturecosmos at yahoo.com. Coming up right now, I wanted to go ahead and turn it over to my friend Noah Ian Fine with some more retro gaming thoughts. And welcome, Noah. I want to thank you so much again for stopping onto the show. The floor is yours, my friend. Video games galore are what you're talking about. Well, again, thank you for inviting me as always, Gerald. I'm just going to go back real quick. As for another system that never got the love it deserved, the TurboGrafx-16 from the NEC kind of came and went. And I'm sure people remember its mascot, Bonk, this uh, caveman that would use his head to bash things and move on. Bonk never got the credit he deserved, but eventually after TurboGrafx came and went, Nintendo did purchase the library, and there were... Bonk Nintendo games and uh, a Super Bonk that was on Super Nintendo and eventually in GameCube they did put it on the Hudson Valley collection and there were four titles and it's on volume three and they kind of remastered it a little. Unfortunately it was just in Japan but if you could find it it's reasonably priced and it's in Japanese but if you know how to play the game you, you won't be able to read the dialogue unless you want to get a translator from Google Translate it's it's definitely worth your time, as well as the Tailspin game, which is more of a action adventure game than the Nintendo counterpart. And I'm going to leave it right now on every game that I just said because I can go on and on and on and on and on. There's one catered for you. I know everybody loves Mario and Metroid, and I didn't discuss Castlevania. Completely understandable. But those games belong in a class by themselves. I'm looking at games right now that people have kind of forgotten, like the Island of Lost Toys. And some are good, and some are bad, and some I put back in the box. There are a few homebrew games where programmers made their own Super Nintendo or Nintendo games. There are some ROM hacks where some programmers, especially pac and SaveDave.com, He took a couple of games like Alien Syndrome, which is this overhead shooting game, kind of like Smash TV or Zombies Ate My Neighbors, and made it into a Rick and Morty game after Rick and Morty came out in 2014. A very good game, too, and and the bosses are pretty much characters from the show. So it's not bad. And I feel that there's one catered for you more because it's just something different for variety purposes. Again, the Batman Arkham games are amazing. Star Wars Knights of Old Republic. There's a lot of good games that have come out now on Switch. I still have it in my background. My PlayStation 4 died, but they're coming out PlayStation 5 and the backwards compatibility. And, and I know that PlayStation, with their streaming services, have brought back a lot of the JRPGs and everything. Really hoping 
tons and tons and tons of these games that, again, this would be parts and parts and, and hours. Check them out. So, Gerald, thank you so much. Hope I didn't chew your ear off or anything. I just cannot thank you enough for stopping by and telling us about all the great things that are going on with retro gaming, some of the things that are helping you get through this period of time. And hopefully people will go ahead and find that inspiration too. And if they want to, they can go ahead and reach out to us here at Pop Culture Cosmos and tell us about their retro gaming adventures, dusting off the shelves of some old games or some old systems that they haven't played for a long time and, and telling us their experiences now that they're going ahead and reliving a part of their past. Yeah, and, and for me, unfortunately, the only mom and pop that I know of right now in my neck of the woods is about 45 minutes away. But again, the conventions help because they do tour the conventions and they do have their business cards. I wish I had them with me, but I'm in Southern Florida, so I know everybody is spread out anywhere. I'm sure you, you could just Google it and, and see where you could find a used video game store or a convention that – you know, you can network that way and it, it's definitely, but again, I'm not, they're not my life. I play them for like a few minutes and I'll put them back and everything. But I think if you're into these type of role playing games, definitely check them out. But again, thank you so much, Gerald. Thank you as well, my friend, for taking the time to speak to me about all the great things that are going on with retro gaming and bring up all these great games from the past. Hopefully, like I said, there'll be some way for not only for yourself to continue to get through this tough times, but for hopefully it will be for a lot of people as well. Oh, yeah. I work in the medical field, so I can tell you it, it's I, I just want to say really quick, I'm not going to preach and I'm not going to patronize and I'm not going to sugarcoat it. It's going to be an interesting ride, but it's not as bad as I thought. And I had and I posted this on my on my Facebook and my Twitter I just want to say thank you to everyone out there when I go to Target or Walmart or Publix or Winn-Dixie. Thank you for being civil for everything that come food or paper goods, that you're not fighting each other or yelling at, at the clerks or yelling at the cashiers or yelling at other people. There's no fighting for food or anything. So I just want to say you've been awesome, everyone in this community at this time. So thank you for being civilized during this crisis. Thank you as well to everyone out there that is a part of trying to go ahead and make this a better situation and to our healthcare workers and to everyone out there that are struggling through this crisis or trying to do what they can to make this better. We truly salute them as well. Well, thank you very much, my friend, for taking the time. That's Noah Ian Fain from Hunnic Outcast, you got to go ahead and check out what he's doing at Hunnic Queen and all the great stuff that he's doing today. He talks a lot about retro gaming, and you know what? I can't help but like that as well. Yes, right now it is sadly suspended for a few more months, like I said, because I'm finishing up another nursing program credential. And unfortunately, my co hosts, they got sick, but thankfully they were tested. They're fine. Thank God. They panicked, but they're okay. So they're corona free. But yes, and I, I'm glad you're doing well. So everybody's good on your side too. And hopefully that will stay the case for now it, that everything is okay with us. Hopefully on your side as well. I wish you continued success and health. The door's always open, my friend. We're talking about retro gaming or whatever it is you want to talk about in pop culture. You're always welcome back. Right after the break, it is part two of our April TV update with Jessica Box from the TVRainSky.com right here at the Pop Culture Cosmos. Get ready for Kitty Origins Evolutions, the latest documentary from Rob McCallum. Thrusted into heavy metal stardom as teenagers with their debut release, Kitty has thrashed and conquered the heavy metal world for the past 20 years. Kitty has defied industry norms, fought back against women and rock stereotypes, and inspired generations since they appeared. And now, for the first time, they've decided to share their untold story. Generously peppered with archival footage shot by the band, this film gives you an honest and brutal look at what it takes to survive in the music industry. Order the DVD, Blu-ray, and live CD triple pack that features recordings from throughout their 20-year illustrious history from RobMcCallumFilms.com. RobMcCallumFilms.com, your place for awesome stories about awesome people and films worth watching. (laughs) 
we're back with the Pop Culture Cosmos. It's Gerald coming right back at you here. And it's a TV update for you. It's that time again. And we just truly appreciate her coming back every time she comes back on. You know her as one of the lead writers for the TVRatingsGuide.com. You got to check out what she's doing today at the TVRatingsGuide.com where they do a lot of reviews. Cancel a new index. They've got a great one for each and every network out there. Plus all the great stuff that they're doing as far as their original content and so much more. It is the TVRatingsGuide.com. It is my good friend, Miss Jessica Boggs. And Jessica, great to have you back on the program one more time. A lot of stuff going on when it concerns everybody staying at home. They're watching a lot of stuff out there. So I'll first hit up CBS because I think that's the one that's most topical at this point in time. God has not been so friendly to God friended me. Yes, God Friend and Me got canceled after two seasons, which is a rare season two cancellation for CBS. And that's something disappointing. I know that they're going to have a two-hour finale is what I'm told, I believe, later this month. They almost did that with Hawaii Five-0, and it only ended up being one hour. Yeah, that's that's so weird because they were advertising it for Hawaii Five-0 for over a week, two weeks, that it was going to be a two-hour finale. And I think my house, outside of myself, because I really think the show is just formulaic, even though it's on the beautiful islands of Hawaii, which I just truly enjoy. I think it's really cool there. But it is still a formulaic show. It it was still promised, it seemed like, on social media, because my whole family called, and they gathered around expecting a two-hour, and it didn't happen. So... I want to know why that they spaced out the finale over two episodes in two weeks as opposed to what they were promising in a two-hour. Where where was the mix-up? Because their site still indicated that it was supposed to be a two-hour episode. It was kind of like a bad timing, really. And I don't know how they decided to edit the Hawaii Five-0 finale over two episodes and convert it into one. I mean, it has happened before, but... It's been rare. And I also wanted to say God Friend to Me will end on an April 26th two-hour finale. As of right now, because you don't know a CBS, because it might do the bait and switch again. But as of now, April 26th from 8 to 10, that's where they're going to go ahead and do a two-hour finale. Because God Friend to Me, I guess after two seasons, is an early cancellation for them. Unfortunate for those fans, but it's something I guess that Sunday slot is a really hard slot to maintain and keep getting fans to go ahead and watch it. CBS has always had issues on the weekends. Yeah, it's always had issues at the 8 p.m. hour on Sunday. It's only like football inflated for the fall, and then it gets worse from there. Well, NBC, CBS, and also Fox, they all become reliant on the football ratings, drawing everything into those days. And once... M- the NFL goes away for the off season, you actually see the amount of fans that are really intrigued with whatever products. And I see on the weekends with CBS, it's just been hard for them. They dump a lot of shows there at times. Sometimes they do try to go ahead and put a show for original content right there, but sometimes you see it become a dumping ground for some of their lesser successful shows. Well, yeah. And lately on CBS, it's, become more of a syndication farm. I mean, you'd expect Friday to be a syndication farm, but their Sunday shows are doing much worse than their Friday shows. And that's something to think about because our Friday shows, they have been somewhat of a mainstay for them because of what happens with Y 50 and also Blue Bloods. Blue Bloods has been something that they've, with a syndication, like you talk about syndication, so much for them depends on Blue Blood and what it does, because that is like really out there in syndication at this point in time. And then with Hawaii Five-0, what is the real reasoning behind that as far as 10 seasons done? I, it's, it, it's not because of the ratings. You look at the ratings, and if you were – like right now, if it was just a show that was still playing, you are automatically renewing that show. Yes, and the reason why – Hawaii Five O ended this season is because there was actors that wanted to call it quits. Same thing with Supernatural. 
I think it was the lead actor, if I'm not mistaken. Alex McLaughlin. Yeah, he's you know he's one of the producers on. So he just looks like he was mailing it in on the last few episodes because he just looks tired. He just looks tired. He just looks like he was going through the motions. So I, I can't say I blame him, but still, you have that type of successful show, and and it's really hard to follow for individuals like that. So I know some people there are probably a little bit disappointed that they didn't go ahead longer. I know a lot of fans are because it was a very successful show even to the end of its days. Correct. And it has been a CBS Friday mainstay for quite a while now. And now that has been taking over. Its slot has been filled by Magnum PI, although Magnum PI is not doing as well. It's still doing pretty solid in the Friday time slot. Well, that was something that you and I had spoke about last year as being on the bubble. So it it looks like that, yeah, I know it's not doing as successful as Hawaii Five O. It still has that Hawaii theme, but anything at this point in time in the right direction for it is, is something good because, again, it just solidifies it even more as being something that hopefully will stay on the air for years to come for fans of that show. But, you know, this time last year we were talking about it possibly being canceled. And in fact, it was looking and leaning more in that direction. Oh, correct. But the ratings, as far as it goes, from January onward, I've been looking much better than the rest of the dramas, SANS, NCIS, and FBI. I think it got a big rub from Hawaii Five-0. I think when they had those joint shows together, I think it got a lot of rub from Hawaii Five-0. And I heard in the near future that there'll be some guest appearances by Hawaii Five O stars on the show. So fans can still get their Hawaii Five O fix on Magnum PI in upcoming episodes. So that's some good news there. But there's still a lot more to talk about when it concerns the TV ratings out there. I mean, overall, just doing a blanket, like we talked about earlier this month, there is more people at home. So that's leading to larger ratings overall because I see – series high i see season high i see a lot of these shows have those successful episodes right now because more people are at home watching so for the most part and we'll touch on the other part here in a little while but for the most part it looks like that these shows right now are being watched by more people than you know in a long time well yeah but we've seen nbc's new amsterdam hit a season high in the nine o'clock time slot this past week. Absolutely. And that's something that NCIS has still maintained its high levels. And so many other shows have reached those type of plateaus, which is good. I mean, people are home, they're watching TV. If that's the case, that's good for those broadcast networks that you and I have said for many years now have been on the extreme decline. And it is due to very unfortunate circumstances. I get that. I understand that. And obviously, you really, in, in a real-world scenario, really would not want that to take place. The reason why there's so many people at home watching TV. But, it, it, you know, at least they're watching more broadcast television. That's helping broadcast television at least a little bit. I know it's going to be a, what, a 12 to 24-month boost only as it will probably, you know, by this time, 2022, 2023, probably go back down to whatever level that we were talking about before the crisis. But at least for now, it's a benefit to broadcast networks and also cable networks that are out there right now. Oh, yeah. And cable right now is getting the biggest boost of, is seeing the greatest benefit of the ratings boost from COVID-19 at the moment. How so? Which networks are benefiting from it the most? Are it going to be more reality-based? Is it more procedural television? Is it more HBO premium cables? Is it basic? Who is trending the best? I, I mean, outside the news channels, because we know Fox, we know CNN. I see them regularly getting five, six million. In the case of CNN, two, three, four million. I see them going ahead and spiking with those ratings that they're they're very strong right now. But taking those two and MSNBC out of the equation, who from an entertainment perspective is benefiting the most from this unfortunate event? We know TBS is making a benefit and we know that 
history channel is seeing a boost right now, even though it's always been somewhat high rated. But History Channel, a lot of people are checking out going back because they have the time now to watch the type of programming that they offer. That's not a surprise. How about other networks like TNT or USA, some of these other general entertainment channels? I know USA is up there and FX and all that. What are some of these general entertainment networks doing? You said TBS has seen a lot of benefits from it, but what are some of these other networks doing? AMC is seeing some benefit from it with Better Call Saul going up about seven hundredths from the last week. So it's still pretty steady. We know Discovery Channel's Street Outlaws is doing okay about that. We see the biographies doing okay. And you see FX remaining steady at the moment. Are you seeing any other trends from out there as far as, let's say, HGTV, some of the other reality networks? Because those seem to be the type of shows that are steady, always seem to have their audience, but could find in a pandemic uh, that's unfortunate like this, see a big boost in the type of ratings that they have. We also see reality shows remaining steady. It has its own audience, but it seems like cable news networks are seeing the biggest boost and because people want to hear more about COVID-19 right now and people are freaking out about that. That they are. So, so many different outlets, so many different networks are running those type of specials and those type of commitments to what's going on and updates because everybody wants to know what's going on because there's so much that's out there, so much that's unsure about what's going on in the future for everybody on the planet going forward and how they treat this disease and how they fight against it and you know all that. So we're uh, very unsure at this point in time. So yeah, everybody's trying to go ahead and, and find out what's going on. So anything relating to coronavirus seems to go ahead and get some big numbers. Before we head on out, let's go ahead and talk about what's going on with the rest of the broadcast networks that are up. We know that... ABC is still looking at a short-term boost from not only the comedies, but the dramas as well. Whereas the Goldbergs pretty much stopped its bleeding, even though it's down 25% this season. And so overall, COVID-19 pretty much lessened the bleed at the moment for ABC. CBS, it just pretty much solidified the viewership and Fox has seen season highs from, or near season highs from Mass Singer, which is why more people are watching that right now than anything on NBC or ABC at the moment, as far as the reality front goes. Well, it's something that we have to think about as far as what's going on within the landscape of TV right now. And anybody who's seeing big numbers from this, any shows, any networks at this point in time, Being able to sustain it is going to be the key after this period ends of stay-at-home, quarantine, what have you. I mean, I get the fact that, again, at least through the end of this year, possibly even through the end of next year, more television viewing and higher television viewing is going to be a way of life. It's after that, in 2022 and beyond, how are these networks and TV shows going to be able to go ahead and provide enough content, enough interesting content to sustain those type of ratings, to get people tuned in week after week after week, because you can have those issues where everybody's watching now, but they're not watching later. Well, yeah, that's kind of like the thing, but streaming may get its biggest boost for the later on part in the delayed aspect. Yeah, absolutely. When you have the plus threes and plus sevens for these shows, those are still being adhered to and watched by a lot of people. I know there's a lot of shows that you and I have talked about over the course of the past couple of years that have benefited greatly from the plus threes and plus sevens. But there's still also the fact that even though there is a short-term boost for these broadcast networks and these cable networks, the streaming outlets with Quibi just coming online this month, and you've got HBO Max and Peacock, I just can't believe they call it Peacock, but that's another story. <laughs> you know, it Disney Plus saying that they now have over 50 million subscribers. Netflix is now re- actually more valuable 
to Wall Street right now, the Disney. Imagine that. I never would have thunk that when I was receiving the DVDs in the mail way back when, 10 years ago. But it's different time. Everything's going on so weird. It's just evolving all over the place. But eventually, people have got to go ahead and decide what's going on, what do they want to prefer more, streaming format or broadcast format. And right now, they're able to have the time to go ahead and watch both evenly. But at some point in time, I think the, the marketplace is going to trend even more aggressively towards the streaming market. That's correct. You've seen already streaming go up like double digits. I'm pretty sure it was as high as 22% on the last update. And that's what I wanted to say. Yeah, I, I think I made a mistake and I do want to apologize for that. It was 22%. But not from the last year. It's from the last week. At that time, we spoke earlier this month. So that was from the end of month to the third week to the fourth week. It was a difference of 22% jump. That's when really people started to stay at home. And so that's when you really saw that jump. If you're talking about from last year, it's more than double what it was last year. So I should have said that. So I apologize. So I'm correcting myself now. So it's, and I've, obviously, it's gone even up further since then as far as the viewing is concerned. So I want to hear your thoughts on just the fact that there's so much consumption out there in streaming. I think ultimately these broadcast and cable companies could be put out of business. Not now, it, the coronavirus is delaying it now, but at some point in time in the future, there could be an end to a lot of these smaller networks. There may have already been the an end to like the stronger networks, but you know, unless the networks make a deal with these streaming things or create their own streaming services like you see with NBC Universal and all the networks that are partnering with this new streaming service, then you get to see the money decline unless they make the deal happen with retransmission fees and all that. For the broadcast and cable networks, we're going to have to see what happens. But as long as the content is going in favor there, because we're seeing now, even when it comes to movies heading over to streaming format, with Trolls World Tour, that had the biggest debut ever on streaming for, for a movie as going to digital right away. Now, mind you, that was a movie that could have had some success. Mulan was scheduled two weeks before it. Black Widow was scheduled two weeks after it, and it would have been counter-programming to the Bond movie that was supposed to come out, I believe, around the same point in time. So it would have seen some success in and around those three movies. I think about 100 to 150 million, I was probably guessing off the top of my head. But it still would have found some success. And even though the success of digital can't replace that entirely, the biggest opening ever for digital, that, that's a good sign for these movies that are going straight to digital, that they can find some success going forward. Jessica, I wanted to say to you and to everyone out there, please stay safe. I hope everyone continues to be healthy out there. hope everyone continues to listen out there to what's going on here, but also check out everything going on at the TV Ratings Guide. Stay healthy, stay safe, and if all goes well, I hope to see you next month for a May TV update. I'll definitely be coming back. Once again, it's Jessica Box from the TVRainsGuide.com. You got to check her stuff out today and all the other great articles and reviews and so much more at the TVRainsGuide.com. My friend, it's been great talking as always. Cannot thank you enough for being part of the pop culture. If you're tired of sifting through flea markets for rare and unique games, we can help. Retro City Games in Henderson, Nevada, only five minutes from the Las Vegas Strip, has all your favorite gaming staples, classics, and a wide selection of rare games with new stuff always appearing on our shelves. Come in and chat with Nicole or Doug about your love of games and watch as they help you complete your collection or find your childhood favorite. And don't forget, Retro City Games loves trade-ins. So if you have any Nintendo, Super Nintendo, Sega, Xbox, PlayStation, or even PC games, come in and visit Retro City Games today. Welcome to the new metropolis of gaming, Retro City Games. And we're back to close out the show. It's the Pop Culture Cosmos. Want to thank so much Noah Ian Fine for sharing some more retro gaming memories, and also as well Jessica Box from the TV Reigns Guide for part two of her April TV update. My friend, before we head on out, I wanted to ask you real quick: Justice League Dark. It's one of three projects with JJ Abrams and Bad Robot coming to HBO Max. 
something that I think a lot of comic book fans have been hoping would be materialized in some form or fashion as far as a structural TV series. This is something that we've seen with other fan favorite comic book series in the past year with the boys, with the umbrella Academy and so forth that we've seen over the course of year that have been very successful on streaming outlets. So I want to hear your thoughts on a justice league dark as it comes to HBO max, as someone pointed out that the DC streaming service may be all but done, but HBO max may have something on their hands within let's say next year when it finally comes out, that could be something that is really worth going ahead and investing in the higher price point of HBO Max. Well, I, I think that this whole contract between HBO and Warner Brothers is a great idea. You know, I, I think that HBO is the right place to bring things like that to life. And if I were them, I would just get rid of the DC streaming service. You know, take all the cartoons and all the content from Warner Brothers, put it on HBO. That would be lucrative for both, right? Because you have content going to HBO and you're not having to have people worry about paying for two different services. You know, on the side of Justice League Dark, I love that property. I love that comic book. I love Constantine is a a great character, as I've talked about before on the show. But my big concern with this is because of the realism and the darkness of this show, it would have to either exist in its own universe or be tied in to the existing DCU because I know that they would try to do something like the whole infinite earth thing where they try to cross it with arrow. It cannot be something that would be able to exist in the current DC television universe. It would have to be either its own world or something that would tie in eventually to the DC universe on the big screen. What are your thoughts on that though? I would love to see it on the big screen personally, but since it's going to be what a, a extended series now. I think it's something that they're going to go ahead and play it out on a series. Now, if it becomes successful, now Marvel going forward, you're going to see all these TV shows and all these movies intertwined with each other, and you're going to see all these characters come about now. But as we saw with the Netflix shows from Marvel, they weren't willing to go ahead and give them any kind of time on the big screen. So. It is going to be something that if Justice League Dark becomes a hit on HBO Max, that I think is going to probably lead into something maybe for the big screen because Warner Brothers doesn't have a lot of properties outside of the DC movie universe that they can really rely upon that they haven't touched on already a lot. So that I'm thinking that if Justice League Dark becomes that underground hit or becomes that hit like like let's say the boys does or the umbrella academy or anything else that they've tried to put out there i think that the justice league dark will be a series that they can rely upon and could even see big benefits on possibly an upgrade to the big screen at some point in time with some of their characters like john constantine you talked about constantine i don't think that was such in fact i watched it again the other night with keanu reeves from 2005 or so and I think it wasn't such a bad film. I thought it was a good film. I just think people couldn't really relate to it. But if you familiarize them more in a series format with his character, I think it's someone that could translate very well as far as being that type of draw-in material for a lot of people. Oh, yeah, definitely. I think that Constantine just came out in the wrong time. There weren't any superhero, like big superhero films back then. There was Spider-Man and those movies. And Constantine was is kind of someone who straddles that line between anti-hero, superhero, And really, it is very supernatural. So I don't think that people were ready for that. But I I just don't think that people were ready for a hero like Constantine. You know, that being said, I think Warner Brothers has a lot of faith in Constantine and what it can do. Like, that was their biggest selling property with Vertigo. And that's when Vertigo was absorbed and Constantine got brought into the existing DC comic book universe. And even now, like, they're planning this animated Justice League Dark movie that's going to close out the entire animated universe they've been building for like the past 15 years so they do have a lot of faith in this project and i'm curious to see how it's going to tie together in the animated form but if it is successful in animated form i think that it could be done as far as the real life version of it being incorporated into like the dcu or wherever they're going to go with it Yeah, I have a tendency to agree with you on that because I think it's something that if it's done well and it's done right on an HBO Max format, which these streaming outlets, these streaming shows and these streaming entities are getting a little bit better budget wise or realizing that they have to have money put into it. So the look and the feel and the acting and the presence of them are becoming higher and higher profile. So 
I think that if it's done well enough, we could see this Justice League Dark become a cornerstone of HBO Max. It could be a reason for a lot of people out there to spend that extra money, which we were worried about, like I said before, on the earlier part of the show where I talked about how it's going to be hard for a lot of people to afford HBO Max because it is coming out at a higher price point. They aren't shying away. They aren't trying to go ahead and tell people, you know, hey, go ahead, get a little. No, they're telling you to go ahead and pay the extra money for it. And if they're going to have stuff like Justice League Dark come out next year, that could be something that's very valuable for them and also could be a way for people to go ahead and say, you know what, I can relate to that. And there are more new characters I'd like to see in a bigger format or an expanded format. So, yeah, Justice League Dark is a great idea. And plus, backed by the Bad Robot Studios with J.J. Abrams kind of having his fingers somewhere in that could be a great idea. And then also wanted to mention as well, The Shining being another streaming property that they're going to go ahead and try and uh, introduce as far as it's concerned, whether it's a reboot of the movie or into it like a limited series or whatnot, they're going to go ahead and, and delve into that world as well. So we're seeing all these attempts and all these ideas by big name producers, big name directors, big name artists and actors out there being put onto the smaller screen with these streaming outlets. So these ideas that they couldn't get through maybe onto a big screen format is becoming a reality on the smaller screen format. So it's good to see these all these attempts that are being made. In some cases, like you and I think already with the Justice League Dark, if it's done well, could be a big winner for HBO Max and Warner Brothers. Yeah, and it's also like it's a great way to tell this type of story because Justice League Dark is something that has many, many facets, many angles, many layers to it. These characters Swamp Thing, Constantine, Edrigor the Demon, I think his name is. Like there, There's a lot of layers to that story and a lot of layers to those characters. So I feel like that would take a long time to develop. And I'd rather see it, you know, over the course of like 10 to 12 episodes as opposed to a, a one and a half to two hour movie. I think that could work really well. It would be cool. Uh, then again, you know, then it'd have to be tied in with the thing. I don't know. I think Matt Ryan would be a good Constantine, but I also know that they had Colin Farrell pinned for it for a while. I don't know if anything ever came of that, but you know, this also makes me wonder if Guillermo del Toro's Justice League Dark Project is dead too. This is a property I really, really like, so I just want to see it taken care of. What are your thoughts out there on Justice League Dark heading along with a couple other projects from J.J. Abrams' Bad Robot Productions? heading to HBO Max starting sometime next year. What are your thoughts on that? And more when it comes to HBO Max, share us your thoughts, popculturecosmos at yahoo.com. Also as well, Pop Culture Cosmos, Humanica Media, and Game Source on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram as well. Well, before we head on out, just want to go ahead and say thank you again for listening to all of our shows. It's going to be a great week coming up here at the Pop Culture Cosmos you want to check out also as well on our Pop Culture Cosmos, everywhere you get your podcasts, the Lakers Fast Break shows. In fact, we've got a special NBA 2020 mock draft coming with not one, not two, not three, but four great NBA draft experts. We're all going to do a mock draft from 1 to 30. We're looking forward to it. That's going to be coming up this week. Inside Sports Fantasy Football, we're also going to be doing a special NFL draft episode. So look forward to that. More great Lakers Fast Break episodes and more coming this week to the Pop Culture Cosmos channel and also the Lakers Fast Break channel and Inside Sports Fantasy Football channel separately on their own podcast outlets. My friend, it's been a great episode. Cannot thank you enough for hanging around another episode this week. Any last thoughts on the way out? Yes, I have been playing the Final Fantasy VII remake, so I'd love to chat about that on our next episode. I had actually thought about that. In fact, that's what I was going to try and talk about last week on a Pop Culture Cosmos. But you know what? We'll save it for Friday's show, the PC Multiverse, because I know that's been a hot topic of conversation out there. Plus the scarcity of PlayStation 5s that could be happening upon release. So that's something also a lot to talk about as far as our PC Multiverse, but other great pop culture subjects as well. So I'm looking forward to it, my friend. Cannot wait to see you on Friday for the next episode of the PCC Multiverse. So for Josh Peterson, this is Gerald Glassford. It's another beautiful day in paradise right here in the Pop Culture Cosmos. We thank you for listening. And here's hoping you have yourself a great day.